Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's CEPR Associates meeting featuring Jonathan Coslett. I'm Mark Duggan, the director of the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, and I'm delighted that you're able to join us here today. Uh, now that we have a new presidential administration in place as of about 30 hours ago, it's a great time to have Jonathan join us and speak about how he sees the US economy unfolding in the months ahead during this COVID era that we are in. I'm really looking forward to his thoughts on what we can expect from economic policymakers at the Federal Reserve, in the Biden-Harris administration, and on Capitol Hill. And I also am eager to hear his insights on changes in financial markets uh, during the past year. Uh, Jonathan is a very good friend of ours here at CEPR, and I'm guessing that many of you tuning in already know him. For those who don't, I'm honored to introduce you to Jonathan. Along with being one of our advisory board members at CEPR, He's also the Chief Investment Officer of TPG Capital and a member of the TPG Holdings Executive Committee. He has an MBA from Harvard Business School and a Bachelor of Science in Economics from the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business. Uh, Jonathan is currently on the Board of Directors for Lifetime Fitness and Cushman and & Wakefield, and he's also served on many other boards of prominent companies such as Petco uh, and J. Crew. Uh, along with serving on the CEPR advisory board, he's also on the board of Stanford Children's Hospital. And perhaps most special of all to me, Jonathan has uh, generously volunteered to serve as a guest lecturer for my undergraduate Econ 1 class here at Stanford in each of the last several years. The last time that he did this was more than 10 months ago on Tuesday, March 10th, just as the pandemic was starting uh, to take effect here in the U.S., and how much, and right after Stanford had uh, uh, sent students home for early for the winter quarter, and how much the world has changed uh, since then. Uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing from Jonathan this afternoon. And before uh, I turn things over to him, I just want to remind everyone of our next associates meeting on Monday, February 8th, featuring Vivian Lee, the president of health platforms at Verily Life Sciences. And I'll be looking forward to having many of you hopefully join us during our virtual CEPR Economic Summit during the first week of March with three terrific keynotes, along with sessions on the regulation of big, big tech companies, the future of college sports and more. Uh, after Jonathan presents, I will ask him a few questions and then I'll open things up for questions from all of you. So please send in your questions through the link on your screens and I will do my best to get to most of them later in our session. You don't have to wait until the Q&A session to send those questions in. Feel free to send those in uh, while, if you think of them while he's presenting. Um, with that, uh, with that, I am really just delighted to pass the proverbial mic to Jonathan. And thanks so much again to all of you for being here with us today. And Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mark. Um, hope everyone is doing okay, uh, hanging in there, staying safe and staying healthy in uh, this unbelievably interesting and difficult and challenging set of times we've been through. What I want to do is just spend, uh, I'm going to try to spend about 30 minutes on my kind of comments. I've got a lot of slides and graphs, but just think of them as wallpaper. You won't be able to sort of figure out every X and Y axis. Uh, think of them as wallpaper as I speak. The ones that are, I think, the most interesting, I'll um, spend a little bit more time on. And I'm sure that I'll be a little pressed to get this done in 30 minutes, but I'd like to have at least the same amount of time for Q&A and, and really for discussion. So I'll, uh, I'll see how it goes and I might have to skip over some slides at some point. Now, let me try the most difficult part of the whole event, which is sharing my screen. So let me see if I can do that without, uh, okay, here we go. So I've now shared my screen. Can you guys see my screen? Okay, I see, I see Mark nodding his head. All right. So let's get started here. In May, when the economy shut down, I did uh, an event, a super event with John Taylor. And at that point in time, I described what I thought the economy would look like over the next year. And I sort of described four phases um, with the, the big down, a quick recovery, and then importantly, a double dip in the winter uh, of this year due to a resurgence of COVID. And then of course, once the vaccine came, um, a, uh, a recovery. And I sort of got the shape right. I called it a drunken W. Interestingly, the economy is not down as much on this double dip. It's down a little bit here over the last month or two. We can talk about that, but it's not down as much. But I got sort of the shape right, but maybe not the severity. And boy, 
that shock and awe of the economy shutting down was, was just amazing. GDP down a third uh, in the second quarter, unemployment 15, really 20% when you really uh, account for unemployment the right way. And the stock market, which had been up four or five times over the last decade, went down by a third in just a month, the quickest and most dramatic down in the history of the stock market. And very early on, we were all very concerned what we were seeing. Bankruptcies were starting to rise. Default rates were starting to rise. And then the Fed came. They took interest rates to zero immediately. They took out their bazooka and created uh, several trillion dollars of liquidity into the system. I mean, these numbers are staggering. The Federal, the Federal Reserve balance sheet went from you know, sort of four or five trillion in 2016, 17, 18, it'll probably get to 10 trillion in the next few months. And compare that to 2008, when the balance sheet went from essentially a trillion to two trillion, the scale of what the Fed has done has never been seen before. And quite frankly, it's very unclear what it's all gonna mean. Then we came with the fiscal stimulus, uh, $2 trillion and very smartly directed uh, at, at individuals and households and small businesses, uh, very direct, very in your pocket type of money. And you can see that even at that point in time, um, the stimulus that we were, that we were uh, creating in the United States was much higher than any other country as a percentage of GDP and much higher than what we did when we did the 800 billion uh, after the great financial crisis in 2009. And it kind of worked. So even though people lost their jobs and business was uh, either shut down completely or partially, personal income actually rose dramatically in the spring of 2020 by probably $2 trillion. And on the right, you can see that while spending came back for everyone, the spending came back much more strongly for those who were unemployed than for those who were employed. So it really did work to, in order to keep the economy afloat during this very difficult period of time. And again, almost amazingly, bankruptcies actually started to decline from their baseline, much different than in the great financial crisis. And delinquency rates on credit cards, on auto loans, never really went up and they actually have trended down. It really is something that I don't think any economist uh, would have forecast that these stats would have turned out the way they have. And lo and behold, somehow, some way, the economy by most measures is kind of working its way back to the pre-COVID baseline. And by the end of the third quarter, the GDP was back to about 87% of its prior baseline. And by the end of the fourth quarter, it's probably at 93 or 94% of its prior baseline. And the markets reacted very, very quickly. As quickly as they went down, they came back as quickly and with incredible strength. I mean, look at that red line relative to 2000 uh, and not the, the recovery in 2009, relative to the recovery in 2001, 2002, 2002. It's just a quantum difference. Now there is, you gotta be careful about the averages. There are large variances in these averages. You can see on the right, this is one that separates out strong balance sheet companies and companies with more, more debt, where the investors were concerned that they wouldn't be able to make it to the other side of the crisis. So there are a lot of variances. It's not just the averages do lie a little bit. Uh, okay. So today we're sitting here, world GDP is still down 8%. That is an enormous number in terms of what level of GDP is relative to pre-COVID. Pre but somehow equities in the United States are up double digits. Equities in the rest of the world, excluding the United States are up as well. So the market has decided that they can look through what they believe is a temporary phenomenon and hopefully it is temporary phenomenon. And that some, sometime in the next 12, 18, 24 months, this will all be a distant memory and we'll be back to the same levels of activity that we had prior. And good on the government, good on the fiscal policymakers and the Federal Reserve 
to make sure that we didn't have too many bankruptcies and defaults and things that create permanent structural damage that create sort of the, the vicious cycle down that takes a while to recover from. We had that in 2008 and nine, and it took us a long time to recover. Here, the uh, stimulus and the monetary um, uh, stimulus has really helped to ward off those structural challenges. But of course, we're sitting here today with uh, COVID running out of control in the United States, in Europe, in, in other parts of the world. And it's a very challenging and strange time to feel like the markets are going so strongly and yet the death toll is rising every day in, in, ever, greater day, in ever greater ways. And of course, more and more people are hospitalized. So it's a very, very schizophrenic time to be an economist, to be a business person, to be an investor, and of course, to be a, a father or a son uh, to, 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 uh, to, to your children and, and, uh, and to your parents. Lo and behold, uh, nine months from start to a vaccine, you know, never before had vaccines been created in less than probably three years. Really amazing tribute to science and the dedication of the scientists. But we got a long way to go. You know, we're under 5% vaccinated at this point in the United States, and the rollout has been slower and clumsier and more logistically challenged than we had all hoped. Uh, that's probably not to be unexpected, but it's, uh, it means that it's going to take a while. You can see on the right-hand side, there was a recent survey where, where uh, folks were asked, when will 200 million Americans be vaccinated? And you can see that actually the timing has shifted outward. The expectations of this have actually shifted outward over the last month because of uh, the logistical issues that we've seen in getting uh, people vaccinated. Hopefully the new administration will put a lot of money and time and effort against getting at least a million people vaccinated every day in the United States. So there's a, there's a light at the end of the tunnel and thank goodness for that. So as we go into this next year, two years and, and, and over the more medium term, these are the questions that I ask myself, fiscal policy, how is it gonna evolve with a new administration, with a new con Congress, monetary policy, inflation, equity valuations, are we in a tech bubble? What will the world look like post COVID? What do we think the economy and the markets are gonna look like in the next year or two? And then some longer term issues. I'll try to run through some of those. So on the fiscal policy side, it's a good thing that we got this $900 billion plan off in January, 2021, because for the first time at the end of November and December, we were starting to see fatigue. We were seeing rent, uh, not being collected uh, as highly as it was before. And just generally speaking, that stimulus was kind of wearing itself to where we're just about to kind of run out. And it seems like the US population is generally, generally more, more willing to have the government help out on situations. You can see uh, preferences for more active government, gov government should do more to solve problems. And the Biden administration, their original plan was eight trillion of spending over the next 10 years, financed by four and a half trillion of taxes and other revenue sources. I think it's, we'll see how things go, but now that the Democrats essentially have a slim majority in the Senate, there's a higher likelihood that entitlement expansion, we're obviously seeing that with their $1.9 trillion plan, infrastructure and jobs, probably more likely that we, there will be some tax increases for the, for the higher income strata. Maybe the tax rate goes up to 39.6%. Maybe the capital gains rate goes up to 28%. And then corporate tax rates too might rise from 21% maybe to 20, 25%. And then with the 1.9 trillion new plan that's been suggested by President Biden, look at these numbers, they are just staggering. $5 trillion of stimulus, a $1 trillion to small businesses. This is cumulatively all the plans together, a $1 trillion uh, to households, another 700 billion to unemployment benefits. And look at where this stands relative to either the great financial crisis or any other country. When you talk about going big, 
we have gone big in a big way. I know Janet Yellen just spoke yesterday or two days ago on her view that we should continue to go big. And while I very much appreciate that thought, I think we are getting into a, a, an area now where we're creating enough excess that there's gonna be waste and there's the potential for some real issues down the road, including inflation and bubbles that we gotta be careful about. By the way, sorry, I can hear the gardeners in the back uh, blowing the leaves. So sorry that you might hear some of that. Um, and when we're done with all this, this is what we're gonna be left with. You know, the highest level of government debt we've had in the United States since World War II by a long shot, something that we're gonna to have to think about. How about on the monetary side? On the monetary side, you know, free, free money, I guess, is the, is the slide that really stands out and it really is true. So we talked about the Fed buying securities and increasing their balance sheet by several trillion dollars. Financial conditions have never been easier never been easier as measured by most uh, ways of measuring that. And the money supply in 2020 was up over 20%. So there's 20% more dollar bills chasing an economy that is you know, somewhat lower than it was before. The monetarists would say, Milton Friedman would say, there's no way that that can't lead to inflation. This is the only slide I'm going to have that's a full screen because I think it is just so important and powerful that we all remember that so much of the last 25 to 30 years is that we entered the 1980s at incredibly abnormally high interest rates because of the inflation of the 70s. And we had double digit interest rates. And over the last 30 years, we've gone from double digit interest rates to nearly zero interest rates and we've had negative interest rates now for the last decade. That is an unbelievably unusual thing that we've all gotten the benefit of in business, in markets, in economies, but there's going to be some implications over the long run around negative interest rates where it basically pays to borrow. So that brings up the question, will inflation come back? Inflation's been under 2% now, for almost 20 years. That's partially due to globalization. It's partially due to, um, uh, to productivity, to technology, to immigration. It's, it's been due to all those things. And inflation expectations have really never been lower. If you look at what makes up inflation, the biggest portion is housing. And when interest rates are low, housing, housing prices can be, can be low. Um, you're already seeing housing prices start, starting to rise. And you're, if interest rates start to rise, that piece of the puzzle has some pressure the other way. And of course, the, the other component of inflation is wages. And through this recovery, since 2010-11, wages stayed very benign at one, two, two and a half percent growth. They were starting to pick up pretty strongly in 2017, 18, 19. And then of course COVID came, so there's really no pressure on that other than the, other than the populist pressure for things like minimum wages um, and inequality. And labor partition, participation rates are very, very low. So there is a lot of slack in the labor markets that will help, help buffer any inflationary forces. But as the economy comes back, commodity prices are rising quickly. As interest rates stay very, very low in the United States, the dollar is under pressure that will create inflationary pressures as well. So that's on the other side. On the long term, we got to think about the supply of labor and productivity. So in the next decade, the, the demographics suggest that the supply of working age people in the United States will only be up by a couple percent for the entire decade. That's going to put pressure on wages and labor productivity despite all of this great technology has been very low. It's been in the one, one and a half percent range, despite all the technology that we've seen. That is a combination for an inflationary set of pressures, unless either productivity increases or we're measuring it improperly. And there are some reasons to believe that we're measuring it improperly. 
So the other piece on the long term is a lot of the inflationary de de uh, decline has been because of globalization. Globalization is starting to is starting to plateau, and then we're going to have to issue a ton of treasuries over the next few years, and that in its in and of itself will also push interest rates and push inflation. So there's forces on both sides. In the short term, there's enough slack in the economy and slack in wages and labor that we probably won't have to worry about inflation. But we should just be thoughtful and careful about how things are going to look in two, three years when some of these forces start to, to, to get even more bubbly. And the, and the interest rate markets are starting to move up. And look at the chart on the right. The, the inflation forwards uh, are showing a very rapid decoupling from where interest rates are today. I would spend a little bit of time on China because it's so important to the world economy and the US economy, but I'm gonna a little bit skip over that other than to, to show this one chart. For all the issues and challenges that China has as a, as a country and as a, and as a system, no one handled the virus better than China. And as a result, their economy shut down dramatically came back quickly and now is humming on all cylinders. And by the way, uh, I'm sorry, my, in just a couple of years, China is gonna surpass the US as the largest economy in the world. Let's talk about equities and the stock market and equity valuations. Um, it's important that we look at the components, not just the average. And there's been a move to the top companies, the top 10 companies, the biggest companies. You can see how price to earnings valuations are much higher for the top 10 companies than they are for the rest of uh, the companies in the S&P 500. And the Russell 3000, which is even a broader measure, you can see that the price earnings ratios are double for the larger companies versus the smaller companies. That's a comment on the riskiness of larger companies versus smaller companies. And it's a comment on how the virtuous benefits of scale and investors are buying into those virtuous benefits of scale. We've seen this before um, in the nifty 50s and in uh, the 1999 period. On almost all measures, the, the stock market is uh, at almost record high levels, price to earnings, enterprise value to EBITDA, and partially that's because very low taxes and very low interest rates, which flow through to earnings. But look at it on a sales basis. On a sales basis, valuations have never been higher. And that's because every dollar of sales is flowing into more profits with very high margins as the companies and as capital have exerted pressure over their suppliers and over wages. And that tends to reverse itself over time. So this is the one place we're gonna do a little bit of fundamental math. So I took a, a shot at sort of trying to explain this. So I took an, a, sort of an illustrative company growing seven and a half percent a year and with certain other normal characteristics. In 1985, when the treasuries were at 10% and tax rates were at 46%, that the net present value using the capital asset pricing model for that set of cash flows, you could pay five times for that. In 95, it was seven times. In 2005, it was nine times. That's enterprise value to EBITDA multiples. And last year, it was 12 times. So it does make sense that as interest rates rise, I'm sorry, as interest rates fall, as tax rates fall, the net present value goes up and that thumbnail multiple goes up. And at the end of 2019, the market was trading at about 14 times. So not overly crazy. And when you look at it uh, relative to your alternatives, relative to your riskless alternatives, this is why some would say that as long as interest rates stay low, very low, the market is okay. You can see the, the difference between earnings yields and the 10-year treasury yields are kind of in a good level. The, the fact that you can earn as much on a stock in terms of cash dividends as you can on a bond and you get the, the growth of the stock those are the things that support why valuations are so high. On the tech side, that chart on the left is a composite of growth stocks versus value stock. It's been a massive movement to growth. And again, 
the top five companies in the US, Microsoft, Apple, Google, Facebook, I guess uh, Tesla has now overtaken Facebook. They have, they have performed unbelievably well while the rest of the market has performed well. And the top five companies in the US are equal to most of the other indices in all of Europe. That's how dominant these companies are. We're seeing IPOs back at levels close to 1989. We're seeing venture capital for the last two or three years, both to levels back to levels of 1999-2000. And the NASDAQ composite, that, that little blip that says down 54%, look how small it looks. So that was down by half in 2008. And yet since then, the NASDAQ is up 10x or 5x from the peak in, in 2007. And then Goldman puts out this sort of non-profitable tech basket. And you can see what's happened to the non-profitable companies that do tech over the, just over the last year. They have absolutely skyrocketed. So for those of us who are old enough to be around in, in 1999, 2000, I just want to remind people that trees don't grow to the sky, that human behavior is herd mentality, herd, herd mentality. That's just the, the psyche of, of, of humans. And we've seen some of this, it's different, it's different for sure, but there are also some similarities. In 1997 to 1999, NASDAQ really skyrocketed. And then without a lot of catalysts, it just took the Fed to decide to raise interest rates for the first time. And then a couple of companies like Webvan, which was the Instacart of, of 2000, to realize that they didn't have enough capital to keep growing unprofitably. And the NASDAQ went down by 80%. Microsoft went down by 70%. But there are things that are different. We've spent a ton of money in investing in technology. The ubiquity of the internet, the ability to scale businesses throughout the world based on the internet, that's different. Revenue is growing faster, margins are stronger for the big companies, for the strong companies. Now, not all companies are as big and as strong as, as Apple and Google. So you gotta watch out for who you're talking about. Post COVID, a lot of things are gonna change. Work's gonna change, education's gonna change, entertainment is gonna change, even medical. You know, we're seeing the a totally different behavior in how healthcare is being delivered. My wife, who's a doctor, would say that I can't, I can't diagnose a patient unless I see them, touch them, feel them, take their heart rate, listen to their lungs. Well, guess what? Probably 20% of all healthcare visits will turn out to be virtual within the next couple of years. So looking forward, we're going into 2021 with the economy almost back to where it was. You can see at the end of the year, it started tailing off. The holiday season was actually relatively weak as that stimulus fell off. It's all about jobs. We gotta watch jobs. Jobs will come back. So we've got a good period ahead of us. And the good news is the household is in very good shape. Debt is down a lot from 2008. Debt service is down a lot. And the household really runs the US economy. Businesses have taken advantage of these low interest rates to really lever up. So businesses actually aren't in great shape, but they're still not, as big as the household. GDP is expected to come back and surpass its prior high by the end of 2021. Look at what Goldman is forecasting. Goldman, which has, I think, a very strong macroeconomics team, they're forecasting a huge boom in 2021, much bigger than consensus. Earnings are expected to surpass 2019 levels in 2021 and then go up another almost 20% the next year. But interestingly, the market, if you look at the right-hand chart, this is the S&P 500 at different multiples of two-year forward earnings, not one-year forward earnings, but two-year forward earnings, so 2022. So we're basically trading at 20 times two-year forward earnings. Those are types of, of multiples, even with a normalization that will occur in this year that have never been seen before. And then, this chart on the right shows the cyclicality of human behavior and the cyclicality of, of capitalism and economics. Over the long, long run, stocks have returned about 8% annually. 
8% is the average, but in the up cycles, they can return something like 12, 15% on a 10 year basis, 12, 15% annually. And in the worst case, 2008, uh, 1980, they actually go only modestly negative on a 10 year basis. But look where we are today. We're starting at levels that are very high on this sine curve. And then again, this interest rate chart is so critical to just look at in the context. Never have we had interest rates this low. And this economic cycles chart, good news is cycles, recoveries have been longer and recessions have been shorter. But we've just had the longest recovery ever. And if the, if the economists are right, and I think they will be this year, the economy will surpass its prior high in 2021. So we'll have both the combination of the longest recovery and the shortest downturn ever. And that leads to some longer term issues we got to think about while we're basking in the glow of all that euphoria. Debt, household debt, federal debt, business debt. While the household debt is down off its peak, the business debt and the federal debt has never been higher. So we're at 300% of GDP on a combined basis. We're getting older. So it takes, uh, you know, there's, there's fewer workers supporting more who aren't working. That's a tough dynamic. And the drivers of GDP are essentially growth in workers and productivity per worker. And we already talked about the growth in workers is gonna be low and the productivity has been low. Even though on the right-hand chart, you can see that technology spending, you know, it boomed in the 1990s and that led to really phenomenal productivity of 5% in the late 1990s. But as it boomed in the last decade, productivity has stayed very, very low. That's a real issue. And the US is increasingly a smaller share of the global economy. But look what's happened to the US stock market relative to the rest of the world stock market. The US stock market has become the place to invest in a way that is two sigma uh, off, you know, off any kind of real sort of um, fundamental correlation. And let's just end with, at the end of the day, the big challenge that's going to face the economy, politics, social issues is across the world because of all this, inequality has never been higher, populism has never been higher, political polarization has never been higher, and we get what we had on January 6th as a result of that. So let me stop there, and uh, I know I went a little bit long, but we got plenty of time for, uh, for Q&A and discussion. Mark, I'll pass it back over to you. Great, thanks so much, Jonathan. A uh, lot of information in those uh, graphs and figures, so thank you for, for all of that. Um, and I'll just, uh, I, and I see I've got some great questions that have come in from our audience, um, but I'll start off with a couple of my own and then I'll pivot to those. So you mentioned uh, near the outset of your remarks, um, that Janet Yellen has uh, talked about the need to go big on stimulus. And I'm just curious, like there's gonna be a political, uh, um, there will be a negotiation about, the, about that uh, stimulus, but you know, how do you think about the sort of Goldilocks just right amount, both with respect to how, how big, they're talking about 1.9 trillion, I believe the Biden administration, um, and its composition, like with, you know, steering things towards high bang for the buck uh, components. Um, and so I'm curious to hear how you think about the stimulus, both, both the amount and are, are there some places where maybe the payoff to the stimulus is, is less than others? Well, if I were King for the day or Janet Yellen for the day or somebody for the day, I would allow the $900 billion stimulus plan start making its way into the economy. I would either promise or sort of get buy-in that sometime in the spring, maybe March or April, there should be another trillion dollars, plus or minus, but not now, sometime in the spring. I would focus on unemployed individuals. I'd focus on small businesses because as we all know, these small businesses, the restaurants, the, the dry cleaners, the hair salons, they are getting crushed. They're absolutely getting crushed. And their numbers, you don't see it in the numbers because they're dominated. The numbers are so dominated by the big companies. So I'd focus on those things. 
I'd focus on health, the healthcare system, because the healthcare system is under significant duress. And I would focus on spending a lot of money, as I think the administration is, on getting more vaccines, getting the logistics rolled out so we could expedite the, the vaccine um, uh, rollout by three, four months relative to what it would be otherwise. I think 1.9 trillion is sort of too much money uh, in the sense that it's you know an extra trillion dollars plus of debt. It's an extra trillion dollars of some of that money is going to go into Robinhood stock accounts, and it's going to push, uh, it's going to create more of a bubble and some more um, some more vulnerabilities that will come back to haunt us. So I would three or four months from now another trillion, and I would say that's it. Okay, helpful. Yeah, great. And you sort of talked a little bit about some of the companies that have been getting hit especially hard by uh, the economic shock and the sort of after effects. And, and you know, as obviously the hasn't been just one shock, it's been evolving over time and at different rates in different areas of the country. Um, so, but can you talk a little bit about how you think the economy will look differently? Even like, so let's get, let's, let's fast forward. We've got the vaccine out. We've got really good coverage. A lot of people are taking it. Let's suppose it's effective. Is our economy going to look uh, permanently different? Sometimes economists talk about the scarring effects of recessions. You get people out of work and then when they go back, maybe they're not as productive, but you know, maybe that we just have fewer restaurants. It may be that we have fewer hotels or is that what, how do you see that sort of unfolding? Well, clearly I think this has been an accelerant to the trends that were already happening. It's an accelerant to the, the benefits of convenience and productivity of the internet, being able to have this conversation we're having now as opposed to doing it all in person. As I said, um, healthcare visits, just basic healthcare visits. I mean, think about how inefficient it is when we drive to the doctor's office, wait in his, waiting, his or her waiting room for an hour, have a five minute visit and, the, and then walk out and drive home. That's incredibly inefficient. Now, on the other hand, there are some things that are gonna go right back to where they were and we shouldn't overestimate. It's, it's a little bit of both. There's gonna be things that are accelerated because of this and there are gonna be things that go back to the way they used to be. After 9-11, everyone said, I'm not gonna fly nearly as much. Well, about 20 months after 9-11, we surpassed the levels of flying that people did before 9-11. And since then, the numbers are multiples of that. So things like, are you gonna travel differently? Yes, you will. But I think you're also ultimately gonna go on your European vacation uh, as well. So a little bit of both, and you have to have to subtly think through those pushes and pulls, but it's just mostly an acceleration of the trends that we already knew. We already knew we didn't like shopping you know, in crowded places. We already knew we didn't like going to the doctor's office for a five minute visit. Great, thanks for that. Um, so, you know, just yesterday we see we, there's a new uh, president, new vice president, there's a new Congress. Um, and, you know, it's sometimes said that, uh, you know, new administration, they kind of need to choose their battles in, uh, in their first year. And clearly uh, fighting, uh, you know, getting the vaccine distribution uh, better, um, improving health is hugely important given how many lives have been lost and how many people have been hit by COVID uh, and, and so forth. And then sort of the, the stimulus that you talked a little bit about, um, that's clearly going to loom large, but where else do you think there should be a sense of urgency? Some, some things can happen through, let's say executive orders, and we've already seen a little bit of that. But you know, when you think about the where, where, it, uh, the, uh, where the federal government should focus its attention. First, let's say, let's focus on fiscal policy. And, and related things. Is it tax policy? Is it trade policy? Uh, where do you see the greatest urgency? Well, I think the, the easiest battle will be around infrastructure because there's a bipartisan support for the fact that our roads and our bridges and our airports uh, need, need a lot more money. So that should be a battle that should be won. Um, obviously all the things that are just general stimulus to help out during the pandemic I think we'll, you know, again, that'll probably result in another trillion dollars plus or minus uh, of stimulus at some point here in the next three to six months. I think um, taxes, I think the, the, the administration will push on taxes on the wealthy, but I don't think they're gonna push that hard. And I think they're gonna push on higher taxes for corporations, but they may give that up. 
And uh, then, of course, I think they're going to push very hard on the non-domestic issues of getting to create relationships again in Europe and even in, in China. Um, but they will stay tough on trade in China because there's a lot of bipartisan support for the fact that uh, we need to stay tough enough on trade, on intellectual property. And of course, not everything climate related, uh, I think they'll meet with generally good, uh, you know, good reception on that. So I think, and the interesting thing is for the first time in a long, long time, policy is gonna be governed by the middle because it's gonna be one or two swing votes you know, Mitt Romney and someone else coming over over to the from the Republican side, or vice versa. So policy is going to be governed by the middle, which is a really really good thing. Interesting. So I'm gonna I, I've got a lot of questions here from the audience, so I'm, I, I may come back to one or two of mine, but I want to ask one uh, following: Are you how concerned are you about the unintended consequences of the uh, unprecedented fiscal and monetary stimulus? For example, high yield bonds hit a new low of 4.24% and $17 uh, trillion now in worldwide negative bond yields. So um, thoughts on that? Um, I'm concerned in the medium and the medium term. I'm not concerned in the short term because uh, over the next six, nine, 12 months, we're gonna be coming out of the, the, this period where business has been shut down. Businesses are gonna open up, jobs are gonna come back, spending is gonna keep coming. So there's gonna be no, nothing other than a, a sort of a, a nice recovery to the economy for 2021 and probably into 2022. The, the challenge will become when bubbles are created in the housing market, in the borrowing markets, uh, in the stock market, and uh, that, you know, could come, I don't know, end of 2022, 2023. And if that bubble gets pricked, the, the fall is going to be quite severe just because we're starting from such high, high peaks. Um, so I am concerned about that in the long term, not in the short term. Great. Thanks for that. Um, another question. So this sort of dual questions. Uh, so how different do you think globalization and trade are going to look under a Biden administration? You touched on that a little bit already. And do you think that uh, the Biden administration or Congress or some combination are going to try to break up big tech? Um, I think on the trade side, uh, you know, with, with Europe uh, and our allies uh, in Europe and the UK, I think the trade side is going to, is going to get very um, constructive. And with China, as I mentioned, I think the the approaches will be more moderate and more friendly and more constructive. But I think there's going to be a stubbornness to keeping the, the the tariffs in place until we see some some more movement. But I think that's good. I think that's fine. You've got a very tough um, counterparty on the other side with President Xi and the and the Chinese government. And I think it is a, a good thing if we stay tough, but stay tough in a constructive way, looking for compromise, looking for progress. So I think that's how it'll, it'll, it'll roll out. Um, on the big tech side, I think there is a, gonna be increasing pressure around everything from privacy to the power of some of the large platforms. And I think ultimately there will be, um, some of the companies will have to be split into different parts, just like Microsoft with their antitrust settlement, you know, back 20 years ago. I think you will see that because the ubiquity and the scale and the omnipresence of a Google or of a Facebook are too high at this point to be ignored. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for that. And a uh, question on inflation, which you touched on a bit. Some analysts believe, and are not, not non-trivial number, believe that inflation is the only way out of the current uh, debt, government debt situation. Do you agree? I don't believe it's the only way out. Um, I think it is the, uh, it, it's sort of in some ways the, the sinister way out. And we've seen that before in, in Germany after, after, the, after World War I uh, and, and a little bit in, uh, in, in, in the 1970s as well. But I do think 
that we are, are, our, our children and our grandchildren are gonna really face a lot of pressure in 10, 15, 20, 25 years when the demographics of the advanced world are so much older and there are so fewer workers supporting so people, who, so many people who are older and need health health care, and need uh, and need help to retire. I think it's a very very big problem that because it's a long term issue, no politician will take it on because it's just it's kind of like you know tomorrow's problem. Now there's solutions, right? You don't have to take Medicare from 65 to 60 when actually the age of uh, the life expectancy of that same person versus when Medicare was created has gone up by 10 years. And people today that are 65 are healthier than they were in 19, you know, the 1960s when Medicare was created. There's a lot of things we could do that are politically smart and savvy um, and reasonable. The problem is the politicians just have never been willing to, to do anything against their, their largest constituency, which is older, you know, older Americans. Interesting. And that constituency is going to get bigger and bigger, right? As a share of the population in the coming, in the bigger coming. And bigger. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so a question touching on your, uh, your part about inequality. So the pandemic has pretty clearly impacted high and low income households uh, quite differently um, and arguably worsening income disparities by a significant amount. Um, how worried are you about this? And do you think the consequences will be felt? And if so, where? I am very worried about it because while we've always lived in a country and maybe in a world where there were conservative folks and liberal folks, Republicans and Democrat, people that believed in one idea and people on the other side that believed in another idea, this last four years, you know, thanks partially to ex-president Trump, has really taken the heat up to a level which is, it's, it's, it's so like unbelievable that we had what we had a week ago. Um, and it just, and some of, the, some of the recordings that we heard, some of the quotes from people, and it's just, it's irrational and unbelievable and it, you just have to shake your head and say, really, is this where we are at this point where people feel so strongly about how their lives are not what they want them to be, that they're willing to go to the Capitol, they're willing to, to, to be violent, they're willing to do all those things. I'm very worried about it. I think it's the world's biggest problem because it's not just the United States. It's the case in parts of Europe. It's the case in, it's in a, on a subliminal basis in China, in Hong Kong, in other parts of the world. So we've got to find a way to have the average person feel like they can make a good living, they can educate their kids, they can, uh, they can have a good retirement and not feel as venomous as they feel because in many ways we're on the verge of you know, civil war types of uh, uh, environments. So I'm very worried about it. Not the, this is, uh, we're going to have, we're going to have to figure out how to end on an uplifting note. Well, I'll, I'll end on an up note. The up uh, note we've got some more time, so save it. Cause oh. I know maybe. The, <laughs> um, so I've got, I've got a lot more questions and we're not gonna be able to get to all of them. Um, you talked a bit about China. How accurate do you think the Chinese economic data are, for example, re regarding, uh, GDP and secondly, what is the long-term effect on the Chinese economy of the large amount of debt? and the large number of non-performing loans? Because you sort of held China up as this really good example. They've done well with COVID, you know, and I know some, they've been uh, put out as, you know, they're the one economy that expanded in 2020 and so forth. But can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I skipped over the slide, which went through those long-term issues on China, which is they have stimulated their economy over the last decade, also to the moon through both fiscal and monetary stimulus. And they have taken their debt levels up to 350% of GDP. So they are now riding with massive amounts of debt. Now the debt is essentially government debt at the end of the day because their banking system is part of the government. Uh, and that's on the one hand helpful because they can control credit in, in the way that they want to. And in some sense, they can control the currency 
in a way that they want to to deflate that debt or inflate away that debt if they, if they want to. But it's a lot of leverage that's been put on into the system. And the other thing that they've got going as well as parts of the advanced, the, the advanced world is they're aging even more rapidly because of the one child policy. The one child policy that was in place for almost 30 years means that they actually even have a worse problem with fewer workers supporting uh, more older people. So they've got their own issues coming. Now, on the other hand, they still are coming from a place where the fundamental output and productivity per person is still very low relative to the advanced economies and is rising rapidly. It's rising at six, seven, eight percent productivity. I don't know whether those numbers are exactly right, but it's rising and it's rising rapidly. So they're still on the upward curve of you know taking someone who's been a farmer in a rural area, moving them to um, a more urban area, having them produce multiples of what they produce in output versus when they were on the farms. They still got a long way to go through that. And they're investing in technology, they're investing in education, they're investing in medicine and healthcare, and they have a very strong long-term plan and they've got a lot of control over their populace because of their system. Now, whether that ultimately blows up or not, probably not in the next 10 or 15 years. Um, it could at some point, but right now I think they've got their handle on the right issues and they're, and they're doing the right things, um, but they're gonna have to start liberalizing more. And at some point they're gonna have to have democracy. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so, even uh, okay, so even before COVID, uh, there were a lot of concerns, I think, among economists, policymakers, and others about the growing concentration of industries, the the rising share of let's say the top four yeah. firm industry or what have you. Um, and it seems plausible that the pandemic has sort of amplified that. Um, and so, and perhaps activities by the Fed and other. Uh, government policies have amplified that a bit too, um, between small and big businesses. So, um, and you know, a lot of small businesses are going out of business. It's hard to get really good data on this, but basically, uh, is it the case, do you think that, um, do you think it's the case that small companies, is there market space for them to recover, like small and medium-sized companies, or is this like a persistent trend, the growing concentration? We, you talked about it somewhat with yeah. tech. But across a lot of sectors, this is true. The small and medium-sized companies are kind of shriveling, and is that is that likely to uh, reverse, stop, or continue? I'm a little bit more optimistic on a big part of the economy because we've. It's always been the case that economies of scale and size create cost advantages, and therefore the bigger companies should win share because they're more efficient. That's always been the case. That was the case of the Nifty 50 uh, in, the, in the 50s. But what's also been the case is that those companies, IBM as an example, uh, GE as an example, they get bloated, they get bureaucratic, they become, um, they have the innovator's dilemma where they can't uh, disrupt themselves and a new business comes along, scrappier, hungrier, and they provide a better product or a better service and that's what's always been the case. In the physical world, I feel like that will continue to be the case. In the physical world where a product or service is delivered physically. In the virtual world where the scale of delivering the product and the cost of delivering the product is so much lower when you can push a button and send it out over the, you, over the ubiquitous internet to the world, to the eight, eight billion people in the world, that becomes that becomes more of a, re, of a real virtuous cycle. I mean, obviously you have it with Google and their search. Um, you have it with Facebook and their reach. And that's something where the network effects and the scale effects are harder because once you get to the point where you have a billion people on your network, uh, the cost of delivering that product is so low for you. But never underestimate how when companies get bigger they get lazier, they get more bureaucratic, and somehow, some way, come, someone comes up with a better product. I mean, Skype 
was owned by Microsoft and along came Zoom. Zoom is just better technology. That's it, just better technology that was created and look at what it's created. Um, you know, to, to a certain extent, Tesla as well. A better product, better technology, and it can, it can disrupt things very dramatically. So I'm a little bit more optimistic that we're not in this world where there's only gonna be 10 companies that control, you know, control the whole world or control the whole United States. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so can you talk a bit about uh, the K-shaped recovery uh, if it, and and uh, or I, I'm not sure that's how you would label it and the impact uh, of the pandemic on the um, on the lower strata. You touched on this already a little bit, but one question, sort of a, a related question, is what are the long term effects of the high increase in unemployment among this group? Yeah, I mean, I think the good news is because of all the stimulus, there is less scarring and less permanent structural damage than there would be otherwise. And even if someone hasn't been working for the last six or nine months, actually their savings are probably not much different than they were. And hopefully there's a way for them to get back into the workforce and be productive again once their factory opens, their, their shop opens, their retail store opens again. I think the longer term issues are around the types of skills uh, uh, that work in an economy which is increasingly less physical and more virtual and more educate, uh, more um, information and knowledge oriented as opposed to physical labor oriented. Those are the, the challenging things. There is gonna be scarring though, because there are, you know, as we know, many restaurants, many hair salons, many that, that, are, that are gonna go out of business and they just don't have the, the capital to kind of get it going again. So there is gonna be some of that um, but I'm, I'm hopeful that there'll be as little of that as, as possible and much less than the great financial crisis. But the medium and longer term issues around job skills are the ones that ultimately we all got to find a way to improve people's skills uh, at, at the educational level and at the early level so that they can actually be a, be a member of the workforce. And the workforce, human labor is, you know, it's under pressure. Human labor is under pressure. Okay, I'm going to read one more question uh, from our audience, and then I want you to end on your optimistic note, whatever, uh, whatever uh, that may be. But uh, this, it's it's a theme that you've kind of hit on, but I, I feel like it's sufficiently important because it's going to come up a fair amount in the upcoming year. No one in government, I'm just quoting, including the new Fed, uh, including the Fed chair, seems to care that our debt is now $22 trillion. Is it true that our national debt simply doesn't matter anymore? It matters, but it matters most when interest rates start rising and are higher than they are today, because the cost of that is what bites. It's not, it's never the liability that's an issue. It's when you can't pay your debt service. It's not the size of your mortgage. It's when you can't make your, your annual payments, when you run out of capital. Now we do have a system, as you mentioned, where if the US federal government wants to print a lot of paper and print a lot of dollars, they can, they can inflate away that debt. Now the ramifications of that can be very, very negative if the inflation is not you know, three or 4%, but it's five or six or 7%. You could have a decade or more of something like the 1970s if that were to happen. Um, so, you know, it, it, is a, it is a meaningful concern for me, again, in the medium and long term. And I just, I wish, I wish that politicians would have the guts to understand that there, 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 are, there are easy ways to work on this. And, you know, Simpson Bowles came out with something, whenever that was, how many years ago was that already? 10 years ago, seven? About 10 years, about 10 years 10 ago. years ago. I and mean, it was all super sensible stuff super sensible stuff. And I wish politicians had the guts to address it because they'll be long gone and we may be long gone when, you know, the you know what hits the fan and our kids and our grandkids are gonna suffer from that. And you don't have to look too far to places like France and Japan to see what, what happens when you get into those positions. 
France and Japan, they're very different than the United States. Entrepreneurialism is different. People are different, et cetera, et cetera. But there are real live examples of what happens when all you can do is basically pay your debt off. And you know, Mark, the number, I don't. What is it? 20%, a quarter of our of the US debt is, is purchased by China? A lot, a lot. There's a lot. I don't know what the exact number, but- It's the, probably about a quarter. It's a lot. It's by foreigners, it's a lot, for sure. But between China and Japan, it's probably 40%. With China, it's probably half of that. And, you know, if you ever get into a world, a bipolar world, where China and the U.S. are much less collaborative than they even are today, um, you, could have a, you could have a mandate from China that basically says, you know what, I'm not buying your debt. So let's watch your interest rates go to 6 or 7 or 8%. And let's, and let's see what happens. Right. So we're putting ourselves in a very vulnerable position. Okay, well, now you got to pivot to your, you, you said you were going to end on an uplifting, or I deferred your uplifting note. So, uh, with, yeah, why don't you, uh, we're, we're out of time, so maybe you can just take another minute to, with some concluding thoughts. Well, the, the, the uplifting part is, um, you know, for all of us who are, are skeptical investors and, and worry warts and looking at what can go wrong, I think there's very few people who on the economic and the business side would have predicted how well the systems, not just in the United States, but many places around the world, not all, but many places around the world, the systems have worked to keep the economy in a position that's healthy enough that the economy, the figurative economy can keep its head above water and tread water until we get to the other side. It's hard to know what could have been done better or not better in terms of saving lives. I mean, I'm sure we all have strong views about that. This last spike um, that has been so vicious shows us that this virus is incredibly contagious. And in some ways it's, you know, other than just sort of shutting everything down completely, it's hard to know whether we could have done better or not. Uh, I think obviously in the United States, I think many of us think we could have done somewhat better, but it's a black swan that's you know totally unpredictable and very difficult to deal with. And at least, at least once this is all done, we can come back with an economy that's working and generally healthy and generally moving in an upward direction without the type of really cataclysmic damage we could have had. Um, and I think that's a testament to, to, the, to, to the system of capitalism. I think it's a testament to the governments all over the world uh, that have um, have found the right ways, and to the resilience of of human beings in general, um, that's that's really amazing. So that's my upbeat part. And you know, look, days are getting brighter. It's getting brighter. You know, my my 84 year old mom got vaccinated two days ago. My 84 year old father in law got vaccinated. Uh, things are getting brighter, and we're going to come out of this. This too shall pass. And I think that is the optimistic part of an incredibly difficult, when we, when we look back 10 and 15 and 20 years ago, and we say the COVID crisis of 2020, I mean, that's gonna be like the Great Depression. I mean, people are gonna talk about it like they talk about the Great Depression, a hundred years from now. Yeah, no, it's really has been an unbelievable year. So, well, Jonathan, um, I, we're, we're a little over time. I just wanna uh, thank you again for making time uh, to be with us today and share your insights and, to all of you who are watching uh, uh, live or subsequently recorded, thank you so much for tuning in. And we hope to see you at a future event here at CEPR. And uh, thank you so much. Hope you stay healthy, stay safe. And we look forward to connecting with you again soon. Thank you so much again, Jonathan. Thanks, Mark. And everybody, please stay safe and stay healthy. Take care.